our society, the thing we are aiming at is free choice. The freedom to choose the job we want, the people we want to vote for, the things we want to buy, and always to have many things to choose from. Now the important question is, can this kind of society survive with big business appearing to get bigger and bigger? Is big business compatible with a free, competitive society? You know, I was in the barber shop this morning, you excuse the digression, gentlemen, but I think you'll be interested in knowing that this very subject was the only thing they talked about. Competition, ha, that's a laugh. As if everyone don't know, there's no such thing as competition anymore in this country. Take Charlie Bates, you know him, Tom. Sure, the guy who owns a grocery store. The guy who used to own the grocery store, until they ran him out of business. Who's they? Oh, this big chain store moved into the same block he was on. Bingo, that was the end of Charlie's store. What's he doing now? Well, he's got a little roadside restaurant next to a truck stop. All the drivers put in there. Seems to me he's found something he can do better at. And what about this guy in my neighborhood? He's doing okay. And there are two chain stores in his block. I know that store, Tom. The women really like that place. Sure, he gives them free delivery, stays open on Sundays, lets them have a charge account, and stocks any brands his customers call for. That fella is selling extra service, and that's why he's still in business. Of course, he gets a little more on most items. Sure, but all that extra service is worth it. That's what my wife says. Why, she can order by telephone anytime she wants to. She doesn't have to leave the kids to go shopping. Well, maybe, but all the same, I don't understand what's going on in this country. It seems to me the big fellas are slowly choking off the little guys. They're swallowing up the wealth, the power. And if you ask me, doing away with free enterprise, too. I don't know about that, boys. I just don't know. Me, I'm not even sure I know what a big business is let alone what it's doing to competition in this country. So, in this study, the first question we asked was, just how does big business fit into our competitive economy? For ours is a competitive economy in which everyone is trying to increase his real income. To see how big business fits in, we've set up a sort of a scale which describes the main facts of our economic structure. At one end of the scale, we find enterprises owned and operated by the government. Such services must be available and must meet certain minimum standards. It falls to the government to see that they do. Closely related to the government-operated enterprises are those the government has come to regulate, chiefly railways and such public utilities as gas and electric companies, and communications like the telegraph and telephone companies. The duplication of facilities in this area would be wasteful and costly, so such businesses are regarded as natural monopolies. We have placed them under government control. Since banks and insurance companies are custodians of the people's funds, they are vested with a special public interest. Therefore, they too are subject to some degree of government regulation. But there are other types of enterprises requiring far less detailed government regulation. Among these are small businesses which originate 45% of the nation's income. These include farmers, professional men, and merchants, most of whom own and manage their businesses. These small businessmen are free to compete as they see fit within the broad framework of certain general laws. Small businessmen compete on a personalized basis. They specialize in individual deals, fitting their services and prices to the conditions of local markets. Their methods of competition are flexible, responding to short-run opportunities. Now, returning to our scale, we find, toward the middle, firms of intermediate size which account for 23% of the national income. While many of these concerns are managed by their owners, they commonly engage in business requiring large plants, big staffs, and considerable resources. Thus, their methods of competition are less personalized, more formal than those of smaller businesses. But up the scale a bit, and actually there is no clear dividing line, we find managerial enterprise, contributing 13% of the nation's income. Corporations run by professional managers who may or may not own stock in the company. It is among managerial enterprises that we find big businesses, which for our purposes, are those industrial concerns listing $100 million or more of total assets. 
These are the giants of industry whose very existence involves organizations of capital, labor, and raw materials on a tremendous scale. Because of their vast size, the plans, policies, and competitive practices of big businesses must operate on a long-term basis. In contrast to the more limited scope of most corporations, practically every big business cuts across the entire community. Its stockholder owners are found in many levels of society. Its managers are chosen because of their training and experience. Its thousands of employees come from all over the country. And its suppliers, raw materials, and its customers often come from all over the world. This makes of every big business a community of interest. This community of interest means that the decisions of big business affect large segments of society. Therefore, society demands that big business transactions be open for public scrutiny. But is public scrutiny enough? Or does the very fact of bigness mean that competition is being increasingly restricted? This is the next question I studied. But first, let's go back to the barbershop. They were talking about this very problem of big business. There you are, sir. Hey, just look at this. Can I buy a car for less than this price? Can I? No, of course you can. But you can shop around and make a better deal on your old one, like I did. Well, sure, you can make a deal with a little guy, but what I'm getting at is big businesses. The bigger they get, the harder it is for the little guy to get his. Big fellas just don't have to pay any attention to us. How can they, Ed? An elephant can't turn around on a dime. Seems to me those fellas have got to keep their eyes on the big move, the long pull. They can't change their mind about a million dollars or a thousand employees just to give their customers a special deal or take them for an extra 25 bucks. As long as I know what the list price is, I'm going to know where to shop around. And I can tell if a sharp dealer is taking me for a ride. Tom's right, Ed. The big fellows are worried most what their big competitors are going to do. What do you mean, worry? They don't have to worry. There they are, a small bunch with a lock on the market. They were smart, they're lucky enough to get big early. And then they stay that way. Their gang hasn't changed for 50 years. That's right. When I was a kid, we had the same big companies that we do now. Bunch of monopolies. That's all we've got in this country, and I don't like it. So you see, many people think that big business is automatically a monopoly. And they think that with monopoly necessarily comes permanent protection from competitive pressure. Is this true? Is any big industrial concern with assets of hundreds of millions of dollars automatically a monopoly? One way to answer this question is to determine how complete and permanent is the hold of a big business on the market. To do this, let's take a look at the 100 largest businesses and see what has happened in their ranks over the past 40 years. The shipbuilding, leather, and coal mining industries were all represented in 1909. Today, they are no longer among the top 100. All told, only 36 companies who were among the 100 largest in 1909 are still there. But what about those who stayed? In 1909, one steel company controlled more than two-thirds of the assets of the entire steel industry. Today, this company meets strong competition from other steel companies and with the rest of the industry, it faces the competitive pressure of lighter metals and of alloys produced by the chemical industries. Petroleum is today the biggest of the industrial groups, and it was among the biggest in 1909. But then there was essentially one mammoth trust that owned more than three-fourths of the petroleum industry. Today, the total assets of that industry are divided among many companies, companies which compete among each other vigorously and intensively. Many of these newer companies are now larger than the original trust. In transportation, producers of railroad equipment led the field in 1909, but have given ground before the competitive challenge of automobiles, trucks, and airplanes. And within the railroad industry itself, the steam locomotive is giving graphic development of the diesel. Why have some big businesses disappeared from view while others have grown? No business, after all, would willingly allow itself to be pushed out of the lead, now, what are the forces within industry itself which brings about such changes? Now, wait a minute, Roger. 
I don't believe we've given enough weight to the influence of government in this field. You were just talking about the petroleum industry. It took the Supreme Court to break up that combine in 1911. Yes, of course. We do point out that we can take antitrust action when necessary. If a business reaches the point where it poses a lasting threat to competition, despite the forces of competition, we must resort to other means. We can leave it as a monopoly in private hands, but subjected to close government regulation. Or we can attack those practices which threaten competition and by enjoining them, try to reestablish competition. As a last resort, when no other way appears to restore competition, the courts may order the business divided up into units that can revive a competitive market. But in most cases, much more powerful forces are at work. Forces found within the framework of big business itself. Our history shows that most monopolies, if not taken over by the government, topple ultimately because of their own weaknesses. A giant of a hundred million dollars toppling because of its own weaknesses? It sounds a little far-fetched, Roger. What can we give as supporting evidence? Well, we do give this example. More than 50 years ago, a certain group set out to secure a monopoly on asphalt. At the time, the best asphalt came almost exclusively from Trinidad and Venezuela. This group managed by financial manipulations to secure an almost complete monopoly on the world's supply of asphalt and control over 80% of the paving business in the United States. But suddenly the petroleum industry in the United States discovered how to produce good asphalt from California petroleum. This new product could be laid down on the eastern seaboard as cheaply as the Trinidad output. And so the big competitive advantage of natural asphalt disappeared. And this huge company, left high and dry with millions of dollars invested, toppled over and went into receivership in three years. Many times, industrial giants have lost ground because they sought bigness without regard to efficiency, thinking they could maintain a dominant position by bigness alone. But bigness is not enough. Competitive success demands efficiency. In the search for efficiency, big business has to face many problems one of which is the matter of its relations with its suppliers. Take a company producing refrigerators. It manufactures its own refrigerator walls, its own shelves, the metal for the ice trays, and a number of other important parts. But what about rubber insulation, compressor valves, chromium handles, plastic vegetable trays? And what about brick, glass, copper wire, railroad cars, paper boxes, and the host of things large and small required to maintain a big plant? Inevitably, some of these vital supplies must be procured by a big business from a number of small businesses, which can produce them more efficiently and more cheaply than the big business itself. Suppliers are an essential item in every big business. And in dealing with suppliers, big business is compelled to compete. I found a good example of that when I was interviewing John Harmon, vice president in charge of purchasing of a large industrial concern. Harmon was trying to negotiate a new agreement with one of his smaller suppliers. Harrison, take a look at this. Hmm, so you have a casting on the gear we're making for you. Yes, one of our other suppliers has been working on it. Our tests indicate that it'll be all right in our assembly. Maybe so, if you don't need close tolerances. It'll cost us a lot less than the machine gear, of course. We've had some big cost increases lately, and we're looking for every way to cut costs up and down the line. So we're thinking of switching our order to him. But before we do so, we want to know whether you can meet this competition. We're a precision machining organization, Mr. Harmon. We're not set up for casting. Well, I'm sorry. We've been doing business together for a long time. But as things stand, we'll have to make a deal for the cast gears. I'm sorry, too. We've worked out a pretty smooth team operation through the years. I'm sure you know it's worth a lot to have our stuff delivered right where you want it and with just the right finish. That's right, Harrison. But our competition is pushing us and we've got to keep our costs down. Well, I guess I'll have to drum up some new business with people who have to have precision machining. Hello there, Mr. Harmon. How are you? 
Well, I'm calling to see if we can't set up a new arrangement with you. We made that deal for cast gears. Yes, I know. Well, they just didn't seem able to give us the package we needed. They had trouble meeting our specifications to begin with, and their quality varied. I'd like to help you out, but we didn't handle with our present setup. We picked up a new account. Who? Oh, one of your competitors. We had to do some retooling for them, and... Well, it'd take time to get set up again to do that special machining you need. Lunch? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. And when we get together, I'd like to tell you about a new valve we've developed that may be just what you've been looking for. So you see, big business competes with big and little enterprises in picking suppliers. Any one company would have a hard time getting a tight grip on them. The market is too big and too flexible. A supplier looking for new business will easily find it. Especially if he is willing to meet the special needs of new buyers. New situations are always cropping up in business and the big fellows feel the pressure as much as the little ones. But where does that pressure originate? Well, part of it comes from the stockholder, part of it from labor, and part... Certainly it's not all from within big business itself. No, as a matter of fact, the ultimate pressure comes from the customer. The man who buys is the man who really builds up the pressure on big business. I'm sorry, that won't do. I know it's cheaper, but I want something that will last. I want to try that new gadget. Nope. Not good enough. Something new. Something better. Something. Something. Here's, here's the nub of the problem. Our sales in the textile field are way off for the last two quarters. Our other lines are holding up all right. But what can we do to get our fabrics moving again? Well, we're trying everything we know. Our sales and promotion staffs are beating the bushes for new customers. We're trying out every new application we can think of. Draperies, curtains, upholstery. What about automobile seat covers? We've thought of that, too. What's more, we've asked our main outlets to tell us what we can do to move our stock. But every time, the answer seems to be that this new synthetic fiber beats us out. It's just as washable, moth-proof, fire-proof, and long-wearing as ours. But now that they've found out how to make their fiber take brilliant dyes, we've lost our edge. Well, Dr. Barton, I guess we'll have to turn to you again. Your research and development department has done a swell job as our uh, sales insurance staff for the last few years. But we're up against a tough one this time. Now, this new fiber puts us way behind. Can your boys come up with a better one and get us back into the running again? How much will you need to get started? Well, we'll need an initial appropriation of 300,000 and we'll try to recruit some special staff. But you know we can't give you a real answer as to what it'll cost or how long it'll take. We might hit it the first month on the first hundred thousand. Or it may take five years or ten million dollars before we come up with the answer. Isn't that pretty stiff, Dr. Barton? Certainly. But if you want research results, you have to be willing and able to go that high. We might never find the answer. But along the way, we might come onto something we aren't even looking for that will give the company a chance to pioneer a whole new field. Yet don't forget, there are other research staffs working in this same area. My men down in the labs have no monopoly on ideas. Somebody else eager to improve his own economic position is always waiting for a chance to wedge a new product, a substitution, or a new way of doing things into the market. But every innovation, every new invention forces them to develop still other inventions and generates a series of new developments that result in renewed competition all along the line and in more abundant choices for us all. For it is abundant choice that is one of the most important goals of a free people. And our experience indicates that freedom in the market fosters freedom throughout society. Freedom of the market, freedom to enter into most lines of business. Freedom of movement from job to job. Freedom to create and invent new and better ways of providing for our needs. This is the competitive process and helps distinguish democracy from dictatorship. As long as big business, or any business, is operated in ways that promote competition, it is performing its true function, adding to the store of goods and services that make life freer and richer for us all. <laughs>